Hello, I'm Colin Doherty, General Manager of KNXT, and we have the great opportunity today to have a conversation with Bishop Armando Ochoa as he celebrates his first anniversary as the Bishop of the Fresno Diocese. And Bishop, uh, welcome. And uh, it has been a trying year, I would imagine, by celebrating your first anniversary with the, the, the diocese here, but your 16th anniversary with the El Paso Diocese. It really has, because uh, as many of you know, that um, with my being named as the fifth bishop of Fresno, I, I was invited to accept the designation of apostolic administrator of the Diocese of El Paso as well. Uh, much of that was due to a lot of litigation that's taking place that was on the burner uh, before I was appointed. And it, it was thought by those who really know more than I do along these lines that it was really opportune that I would be there in a position to kind of facilitate in the absence of a diocesan bishop that is um, apostolic administrator, I would be able to add my input and not just leave it to the delegate who is my vicar general and he would be left kind of on his own. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very happy to have tried to facilitate that, but it has been obviously, as you can imagine, a, a distraction. Uh, at times a welcome distraction, at other times an unwelcome distraction because uh, I haven't been able to be present as much as I would like to be present to the people, the faith community of the Diocese of Fresno as I would like to be. Uh, nor have I been able to be present as much as I would have liked to to the people of my former diocese of El Paso. Mm -hmm. So it has been an uphill challenge. Mm -hmm. Do you see any relief coming for that? I would hope and pray <laughs> that the naming of my successor is around the corner. The good news is uh, the Diocese of Las Cruces right next door to El Paso just received uh, their new bishop two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So I would like to believe we're in the ballpark, and it's been now probably, it will have been uh, 13, 13 months since my naming, uh, my appointment as the Bishop of Fresno. So I think we're kind of in the ballpark, but I, I know that there are probably about eight or nine other dioceses as I speak that are also awaiting the appointment of a diocesan bishop. And uh, so we'll leave it in the hands of the Holy Father and, uh, and the nuncio to, <laughs> to get to me at the appointed hour. We'll pray that that moves along very <laughs> fast for you because I can imagine the load that you carry. Now, after a year of being here, what is your assessment of the Fresno Diocese? Well, I, I'm just really deeply uh, touched that I've been able to physically be, be present at maybe only about 75 of my 80 nine parishes and in a very artificial way I've gotten a wonderful flavor because most of this has been in the context of a confirmation liturgy. Uh, the other liturgies I've gone over I was just recently at the 150th anniversary of the oldest uh, parish um, continuously offering service to the people of God and that is Mariposa. So I, I've been to other parishes in a very artificial way, but I've got a, a nice flavor because I've celebrated a liturgy. I've been with the people either at Mass or a nice reception afterwards and got to have a nice little flavor, not only driving to the venue, but also being present there for a few hours with the people. So it's an artificial way of getting to know um, the diocese, but it has been a really interesting uh, journey this past mm -hmm. year, uh, this year, because I've done a lot of driving right. myself. This is the 14th largest diocese in the United States, and of course a tremendous territory, as we all know, 35,000 square miles, separated by a Sierra um, mountain range. <laughs> oh, has there been any surprises in, uh, in what you have, have seen or heard in the last year? I, I think one of the biggest surprises to me, first of all for me, having grown up in Southern California, specifically in the Ventura County area and my hometown of Oxnard, 
I grew up thinking that was the end all of all agricultural in the world. Little did I know until I started driving around that we are the breadbasket uh, of not only just the United States, but really of the world. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a surprise to me. Somehow, I just never made that connection. Secondly, I, I've been really, really surprised uh, to be welcomed as the outsider coming in. Uh, a wonderful reception, not only by uh, the presbyterate, and certainly the clergy, but many of the people, uh, because I'm the outsider literally coming in, and, and they do, I'm not a known quantity, so they've been very, very forgiving of my being uh, tardy to show up because uh, my GPS was off by maybe an <laughs> hour or, or two, or, but um, they've been very, very forgiving. But I've been pleasantly surprised to see uh, in the part of my clergy the wonderful, wonderful uh, walking the extra mile because so many not only have their own parish but are responsible and have pastoral responsibility for other mission churches and to see how well they are reaching out to the people of God entrusted mm -hmm. to, their, to their care has been for me very uplifting. It's been very, very uplifting to, to, to understand that we're all in this together but they are a real part of my team, mm -hmm. and they are real team players. So uh, that has been uh, really very, very affirming. Secondly, to see the wonderful role of the laity, how they are enhancing the pastoral outreach of our, of our um, clergy in so many ways and through the ministries, and whether it because they have gone through the New Wine program, and uh, have really prepared themselves to step up to the plate. That has been a, a, a beautiful, beautiful gift that has been given to me, and I really appreciate that because having come from a diocese that also is strong on lay participation, uh, it's a nice transition. Mm -hmm. Do you see the, the lay participation becoming uh, more so in the, in the future? Because obviously uh, the priests are not there as you would like to see as many more priests in the parish, in the parishes? You know, certainly with the scarcity of the priests, uh, the ordained clergy, not just here in, in Fresno, but uh, nationwide, and the decreasing numbers, because our numbers, uh, not only are we having less hair, but our gray hair is getting even grayer, I, I really see the participation of the laity, is, is them stepping up, taking stronger roles as a real important part. The fact that not only does canon law um, really expect but mandates a, a financial uh, council in every parish, and these are wonderful qualified lay people uh, in the field of business, in the field of economics, in the field of uh, the marketplace, working in collaboration with their priests. That's at the minimum. You add to that the incorporation of many people in the parish pastoral council, and not only that, but the other lay ministries that are afforded, you know, the preparation of uh, people in bereavement ministry, people in retreat, people in detention ministry, our catechist, um, our Eucharistic ministers, our lectors, I certainly see. But I see the secret, and I think, God rest him, Bishop John also saw the importance of not only people stepping up to the plate, but being prepared adequately to take on those new roles and assume mm -hmm. those new roles. So I, I, I'm very, very pleased with what I anticipate is going to be a continued growth in the direction Bishop John put in mm -hmm. place. Now, you have about uh, 60 deacons, active deacons, I believe, in, in the diocese. How long does it take for a, a man to become a deacon? Basically, here in the, in the diocese, we have a, a requirement, uh, a, a year of discernment, and then basically four years of actual formation. That year, the discernment is really not only for the candidate, but also for his wife to get a flavor of the kinds of things that will be asked of him. And then during the next four years of the actual formation, both the husband and the wife, in most cases, because we do have single uh, celibate uh, candidates, 
who present themselves. I don't think we have one right now, but we have in, in, in certainly the history of the, of the diaconate. But, but it normally is the better part of a four to five year mm -hmm. process, an ongoing process, because it really is a wonderful group. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that they are a gift to the diocese. Uh, I, I, I kind of smile because uh, my brother bishops, uh, way before my time in 68 and 69, when they approached the Holy Father and asked for the restoration of the diaconate, those of my brothers were in the episcopacy, but they were missionary bishops. They were talking about the restoration of the diaconate, principally in what you and I might think of as third world countries. Mm -hmm. What we have now is a restored diaconate where we have almost 17,000 in the United States alone and uh, at last count probably 3,500 worldwide. So the missionary bishops, as much as they were pushing for it, um, were not able to service for a thousand and one different reasons uh, sufficient candidates. But here in the United States we picked up the ball and run with it. What about the ethnic diversity of the valley? Was that a surprise to you when you, when you came here? Uh, coming from originally the Archdiocese of Los Angeles where liturgies are celebrated um, and minister, ministry is offered in 52 different languages, I had a foot in the ground, a uh, foot in the door we might say. Uh, so I was in one sense prepared for it. But I, I've run across groups, for example, Armong Catholics, the presence of Armongs. I had heard about them before, but I never really had much contact with them. And now I've been introduced with them. Our Vietnamese, I've uh, not in my former diocese, but in Los Angeles, limited expression. But I think the other groups, our Korean Catholics, our Filipino Catholics, you know, uh, the large Hispanic presence, uh, the ethnic diversity, our Native Americans to a limited degree, uh, all of the above and none of the above, I, I think it, it has been a welcome, um, a welcome um, new area of my ministry that I, uh, I, I, I enjoy people and certainly enjoy finding out about the cultural diversity of the, of the diocese that I've walked into. Okay. Uh, going to looking at education, uh, what's your assessment of Catholic education in the United States? I'm a product of Catholic education from kindergarten all the way through the seminary and I was really blessed. Uh, that being said, I, I know I'm probably in the minority of not just bishops but also priests who have received our Catholic education in Catholic schools. Um, and because of that, uh, there are unresolved challenges nationwide. I, I know I don't have the number of schools that have had to be closed for a thousand and one reasons. And, and uh, the most recent in my own diocese, diocese this past week. Uh, but that being said, Catholic education continues to be an advantage for a lifetime advantage for those who really avail themselves of that. The up, uh, uphill challenge is to get more and more people uh, involved in doing everything we can to strengthen uh, the endowments in place for tuition assistance for our kids and also uh, to bolster up and, and to strengthen um, our tuition, not our tuition, but our salaries for our wonderful Catholic uh, teachers. Because right now uh, we would like to believe that they're approximating 80% of their brothers and sisters out in the marketplace in the public schools, but we're not quite there yet. We would love to get them there. So the challenge that I really see nationwide is, first of all, how are we going to, and especially here, how are we going to make Every kid who wants to receive a Catholic education, how are we, are we going to afford him an opportunity to do that? Secondly, how are we going to work to in the tuition assistance to build up that fund where we're going to be able to give a credible cut rate to those schools, the 22 schools that we do have here? Uh, that is really a, a challenge. Another challenge I really see is, uh, you know as well as I, Colin, that the women religious, God bless them uh, in the United States, that 
during my generation and, and below were really present and they're the reasons why we are a priest and, and women really just straight across the, the board. We have less and less of those available now. The average age of our women religious is well up in the 60s. So are we getting vocations, especially into teaching orders? I don't think so. That being said, um, the challenge I see is preparing our lay people to step up to leadership roles so that they might feel comfortable in making sure that the Catholic identity of our schools is going to be present, not only in the faculty, but in the environment, so that those families can be assured that sending their kids, their young people, to our Catholic schools is not just going to be on paper, academically, a wonderful advantage, but really an advantage, a spiritual advantage for the rest of their mm -hmm. lives as well. And that's the challenge. We need to make sure and invite our lay ecclesial um, workers out there. And we have some 9,000 of them being formed in our Catholic University and our colleges right now. But to, to make sure that a group, a credible number of them go into Catholic education, not only as teachers, but as principals, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going to be part of the answer, I right. think, in the future. Of course, one of the major things is the fact that Catholic education high schools, 98 percent, or a very extreme high percent of the students go on to college or further education. And then, of course, Garces uh, High School next year is going to bring in iPads for all of the students and the teachers. So you really, in many ways, are on the cutting edge of education. We are on the cutting edge, but at the same time, too, we suffer from a perception that Catholic schools right now are only for those who are financially stable, who come from financially stable backgrounds, and we have to really break that down so that we might be able to do everything possible to make it an affordable experience for any child who wants a Catholic education. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, the, the wonderful, wonderful um, college acceptance rates uh, of our Catholic high schools are too, it is really up there in the upper 90 percent. Now of that, how many actually graduate? I would like to believe a good percentage of them as well. But I, I, I'm so proud of our schools, uh, our, our, our Catholic schools. They, they offer a, a, a tremendous gift to our Catholic mm -hmm. culture here in, in the Diocese of Fresno and nationwide. Jumping ahead to a sort of a, a national issue here, the bishops meet at least once a year, if maybe not more, but at least once a year of the, the United States. What, uh, what's the goals of the Catholic bishops? Well, we have four pillars, and actually we meet twice a year. Uh, November, we always meet for what we call the business meeting, and that's always in Baltimore. Uh, the spring or the summer meeting is uh, this year. It's going to be in the in the San Diego area. So we'll we'll have a, an assembly down there for three or four days. So twice a year we meet. But one of the strong areas is, is um, strengthening the role of, of marriage. Uh, that is going to be one of our priorities. Vocations uh, straight across the board, especially vocations to ordain ministry is another area of concern. Our youth is another, which would include, in many cultures, uh, the age groups of 13 up to the early 30s. Uh, and certainly uh, those are three areas that come to mind that are very, very, very important. Uh, because they're touching the life of the church, and certainly Catholic education would be one of the areas that we are all involved in, and making sure that there is a Catholic identity in all of our colleges and our universities and uh, in our Catholic schools as well. But those are four pillars that we're, we're really working on, obviously vocations, because that really is going to be integral in any of the ongoing uh, faith formation that's taking place because of the of the presence of the clergy mm -hmm. at the local parish level. You've got about 130 priests, I believe, that are active uh, in the in the diocese. And how many uh, seminarians do you have uh, waiting to graduate? I think last number was 16. We have uh, I think 16 seminarians that uh, that are currently in formation. 
And we have a wonderful discernment group, which would count maybe another eight or nine young men who are in the pipeline, I'm happy to say, because they're seriously thinking about um, the priesthood in the foreseeable future. But they meet once once a month with Father Dan, our director of, uh, of vocations for the, for the Diocese of Fresno. And it's either an evening uh, of recollection or a topic where they pray together and they talk about areas of common concern on this year, their journey. I wish that would have been available during my time. During my time, uh, even though I went to Catholic school, I never went to the seminary. So it was sink or swim. I, I showed up at the seminary and hit the ground running. But this wonderful time of discernment is journeying along with these young men, many of whom are in high school, some are in community college, uh, some are in um, on the college, uh, the university level. And so they meet and they pray together and, and some women are involved as well. So I think that's that's the silver lining. I, I continue to believe that the Lord Jesus continues to invite young men to priesthood and consecrated life, which includes our women as well. But our young people have so many options available to them that they need really this opportunity to be mentored and to be walked with. And that's why I, I love this uh, opportunity of having the pipeline, uh, this time of discernment wherein they connect with, with Father Dan uh, during this time of preparation. Great encouragement then for young men and women to, uh, to see what kind of, of uh, career that they would have in the priesthood and the, and the religious orders. Absolutely, and, and, and more and more of our women religious also have uh, one of their sisters dedicated uh, for fostering vocations. And they too on their own, and I'm sorry I don't have any information on when they meet, but I know one particular community here in Fresno uh, probably monthly has a discernment where they pray with one of the sisters and they gather, come and see. It's a wonderful program. Come and see what we're all about mm -hmm. and have a chance to kind of experience firsthand, and not only for a weekend, but more times than not, maybe just uh, an evening where they pray together and talk about areas of concern, uh, where whether young ladies would be uh, thinking in terms of uh, what does it mean to be a, a woman in consecrated life? You know, what does that necessarily mean? You know, I've got my degree in psychology. What's the difference between what you're doing here in your congregation as opposed to what I might be doing on the outside? So I, I, I love these wonderful models mm -hmm. uh, uh, because we have to be creative in this day and age. Great, great. Uh, let's talk about social media for just uh, a few minutes here because uh, Pope Benedict is, seems to be a, a terrific advocate of social media. He's using it, uh, Twittering and, and Facebooking, etc. <laughs> I understand nine different languages, but wow. what's your take on, on today's uh, explosion of social media? I, I think it really is a means that we can reach our young people. I personally, I have not, I'm doing well to get to my emails, but I really stand in admiration of my brother bishops and the priest who are bloggers, uh, who are disciplined enough to really sit down and, and to daily do, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I was just with, uh, at confirmation on Saturday, there was a priest from San Antonio who was here for his nephew's confirmation. And he told me that some members of the family with whom he was staying, they were all excited because the Pope was Twittering. He said, well, I don't know what that meant, but I know he <laughs> pressed a button. But he was impressed that his nieces and nephews were all excited because the Pope was Twittering. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that really is really what the Pope is saying. You know, if you have this as a talent, Use better it. to use it. Yeah. Better to use it because we need anything to reach our youth in this day and age. Before time gets away from us, I wanted to ask you what you see for the future for the diocese. Uh, what plans have you made or thinking about? 
We just had a convocation with the clergy in, uh, in Visalia this past week, and I told them uh, basically a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, when I was approached by the nuncio with the invitation to accept the invitation to be the fifth <laughs> bishop of Fresno at the invitation of the Holy Father, I, I was in shock, as I told everyone principally because at the age of then, 68, when that invitation was given to me, I find myself now 69, I told my priest, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking because realistically, as I approach my 70th birthday around the corner in April, I know that I will on paper have maybe five years. So I wanted them to be, and certainly they were all nodding their heads, they knew that that's the reality. So I think in terms of maybe short-term goals and maybe mid-term goals, and part of that really is dealing with some of the same kinds of pillars. What can I do to bring my priest on on the same kind of issues that the National Conference of Catholic Bishops is working on? A fostering of vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life, a strengthening our Catholic schools, uh, both on the elementary and secondary levels, and once again referring to those areas of concern, what can we do to get maybe those financially stable people to really recognize that this is an area of concern and need for our diocese and involve them as well? And thirdly, really to work on, on programs that are going to strengthen not only youth, but family life. And those were areas that I, I really wanted to see, not only as short-term, but also mid-term. What can we do to really strengthen those areas, to really enhance uh, the foreseeable future, where we're going in this year of faith given to us by the Holy Father? And I see those four pillars as being pivotal, especially strengthening marriage and family life. I, I think... Um, we're in a generation where many of the children entrusted to our pastoral care are sons and daughters of broken marriages. Um, through no fault of their own, at least, these children are, in, are being raised by grandmothers and grandfathers. And so consequently, it adds a new dimension. How are we going to reach not only these children, but to reach grandma and grandpa, but also the mothers and fathers of these children, the biological parents. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I see these as not only short-term goals, but mid-term goals that I would really like to address in collaboration with the laity as well as the priests right. in the foreseeable future. Well, Bishop, this has been a fast half hour here. I can't uh, tell you how quick it's passed. We're, we're out of time, but we want to, of course, bring you back any time that you would like to. But uh, if nothing else, let's make a date for next year on your second anniversary, if, uh, if that comes, uh, will come to pass. But uh, again, Griff, thank you for your insight, and uh, we, uh, we appreciate your time and all your energy that you have given the diocese, and we will pray that you have relief from El Paso as soon as possible. Thank well, you very much. Well, thank you, Colin, and uh, it won't be a year from now that you'll see me again. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs>